The battle of Britain is about to begin. Welcome back to the Leap Suit Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Alessio Cavatori, designer of that reprehensible game, Bolt Action, that has diverted wargamers from the one true god of wargaming, Squad Leader. Alessio, how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I thought you were going to say <laughs> Games Workshop. I was like, oh, oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 I will, I will, I will continue to <laughs> not, oh, not say that. <laughs> Squad Leader, wow, that's, that's an oldie. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I have to admit that is my, my bitterness against bolt action because I feel every time I pick up 28 mil uh, World War II figures, I feel like I'm betraying my, my one true love uh, back from the 70s of Squad Leader. Wow, wow. So you, you must like a little bit more detail in your games. Uh, then. <laughs> I, I do and I don't. I, I, now that I'm uh, older than when I was playing Squad Leader, I like smaller, uh, smaller rule books uh, and more straightforward games. Uh, but we're also joined tonight uh, by Jack Caesar, the only game designer to change his hairstyle more frequently than a Food Network cooking show host. Jack, <laughs> great to have you on the program. Good to see you too. <laughs> All right. Well, and I was I was pleased. You you fit right into my intro line. And as soon as the video came on, I'm like, wait, yes, yet again, it's a different hairstyle. Excellent. So awesome. Uh, Glad yeah, to have. I was wondering what uh, <laughs> you told us they were going to be funny. I was wondering what you were going to choose. I, I, <laughs> I, I have got. I've gotten well, to this point. Really. Exactly. Well, no, I, I was not going to make that joke. We've we've made that joke on a couple previous episodes with uh, <laughs> with a couple of our guys that have have bought uh, My Little Pony chibis for their daughters, and so we've said, "Is this the the miniatures game you're transitioning to?" So <laughs> now we uh, uh, we appreciate both you guys being on the on the podcast. It's a great opportunity to chat with you all, talking you know about Combined Arms, the new game that has come out uh, as a partnership, obviously River Horse and Warlord Studios, published by Warlord. We've gotten our hands on a copy, uh, managed to play through it a few times. I will, I will not say I am an expert by any stretch of the imagination. I have a couple games under my belt. I think in those couple games, I've realized I've totally screwed it up many more times than <laughs> I think. Uh, and I'll start off with this. I, I think the most interesting part to me is everybody walked into this with a different expectation. It's almost the four blind men and an elephant. So every time I have opened up the game with a different opponent, or talked through the rules of the different opponent. It's been fascinating that, that you know, they thought either it would be something else or it's exactly what they thought, but they didn't understand a rule. So one of the questions we really wanted to talk about was, was the inception of it. How did, how did we get from, you know, what everyone imagined would be combined arms to this is actually combined arms, the, the hard and physical, um, you know, project there. Can you guys tell us a little bit about that? But I think, I mean, if you're like me, uh, old geezers that play war games, uh, <laughs> I, I, if I had done the design of the game, maybe it would have been something that you guys would have gone, uh, it would have been more familiar, more old fashioned, I guess. But actually, specifically, not to make something old fashioned, uh, uh, Jack was brought on board. So obviously. Uh, well, thank you, because I don't need any more dusty old gamers' renditions of, uh, of World War II. I can pick up yeah, my squad leader games to do that. <laughs> indeed, not to do another version of squad leader or uh, you know, Axis and Allies or exactly. something like that. We, but like somebody who has a newer, fresher approach than uh, what I, you know, the, the usual thing that I could have done. <laughs> so basically, we worked together. Obviously, uh, I know my bolt action and uh, and obviously uh, we, we, we do board games for, for a living in this company so together we created this rule set which is very board gamey I think is that yeah, Jack's so, contribution uh, so the brief was essentially to create a uh, a marriage an unholy marriage of that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is a good description of it because you will never please anyone with this but yes <laughs> of a um, of a board game that can be played independently that was sort of the the first like this has to stand alone as its own as its own product right um but then also um of course tie in the uh the other products that uh, warlord has so your, your bolt action cruel seas victory at sea and um, blood red skies right and bring those in to sort of allow people to use their their games that they already have to uh to play sort of epic campaign uh systems 
all sort of cut and choose from that as much as they as much as they want so you know if you have bolt action and you're not a big fan of uh, cruel seas then you can just use your bolt action um or vice versa um or you can uh, pick it up just straight as a as a board game um yeah so i was brought on and did the uh the board gamey thing and warlord <laughs> definitely had their uh uh, their notes and their their changes as well. It's gone through um, several minds to sort of become the uh, the product it is, and yeah, it has indeed. Well, so let's talk a little bit about y'all's backgrounds that probably influenced it. So Alessio, we we know uh, of all the things that you have have written and designed and worked on, but what specifically in either your background as a designer, we know you've alluded to things like Mighty Empires. I, I laughed today as I listened to you and Brad talking. You mentioned Empires in Arms. I'm like. My God, I have not seen that game literally in 30 years, I think. Uh, and, and so it, w- it was one of those. What, what were the, the things you designed that you either said, I got to get it right this time, or things that influenced you, you know, like, like Mighty Empires? Well, Mighty Empires for this, I mean, for the, for the brief the Warlord wanted, for what Warlord wanted, I thought Mighty Empires was a natural answer. I mean, it's something that I enjoyed playing when I was young, and it's a perfect example of it works perfectly. As a right, board game. Right. In fact, I think I probably played it more as a board game than actually as a campaign system. I, I never used it as a campaign system, so that's <laughs> right, why I laugh. Exactly. <laughs> that, yeah, absolutely. No, I think we tried. We had a few you know, tries of, like, play Warhammer with this. But it was so good. It was so good as, as a game that, uh, you know, I was speaking with Rick about it just a few days ago, and he was like, uh, you know, saying the saying. It's just when they designed it it, it, it proved very successful as a board game. And, uh, of course, campaigns were played, but uh, I really enjoyed the, the board game element of it. Um, you mentioned Empires in Arms. Uh, that is definitely not an inspiration for, for, <laughs> for this, because, I mean, Empires in Arms takes... Well, the last time I played Empires in Arms, 10 years ago, the game took us about a year, right. one year. <laughs> I, I have never played it because I remember it being in the store, in, in my parents' books and game store, and seeing it, and then someone actually bought it and opened it up and I looked at that and said, no, there's, there's no way that that will ever, that's, that's diplomacy on steroids crossed with Third Reich in that sense and set in the Napoleonic era, you know. No, it's insane. You, needed, uh, you need a full room to leave it there. And luckily, Jervis did have such room. So we left it there and we played with the six other guys. I mean, with like seven players. And yeah, we spent a year of, uh, of that. And it was great. It was one of the best gaming experiences ever, I think, in my life. But yeah, it's a bit of... Bit demanding. This is definitely not what combined arms is, no. Exactly, definitely not combined arms. Uh, Bit more so, flight science than management. <laughs> exactly. So, Jack, from your background, what what things influenced you coming into combined arms, and and what what did you draw on as your previous design experience and gaming experience? So, one of the things that sort of um, was a was a big influence, I guess, was um, was actually a design that we had been working on five years ago um when we were toying around with picking up the uh the hunt for red october right as a uh, as a license uh we toyed around with uh, sort of um a sort of uh, a fleet fleet combat game with the um uh the element of submarines as uh, as hidden hidden units that right. uh that moved sort of similarly um to the uh the concealed movement within um within combined arms and that mechanic was a real, um, uh, real joy. I really liked uh, messing around with that. So that was definitely like one of those things where it was. I sort of pocketed that away when we were doing that that design and thought, you know, I'm going to bring that back at some point in in some game. There's going to be uh, the room for that. And uh, I was happy to find that in that space in in combined arms. Um, yeah, and I've always liked the um, the sort of boxed the boxed war game the sort of uh, your command the colors your um, the waterloo quella fair that sort of like everything contained in its own sort of box and system where you you get everything out and you've got the game complete and and there uh, to sort of digest and and play through uh whereas sometimes i find the uh, the sort of the war gaming um sort of expansions and huge sort of things to it to explore and sort of uh, go out into and rather than sort of delving into the meta of, of what you have sort of placed down on the table in front of you can uh, can get a bit mind frying so um so it was definitely yeah that sort of self-contained 
boxed war game experience that I was trying to uh, to recreate. Well, I know our listeners have heard me say it a number of times. Uh, you know, words mean things, and and what's in a name. The interesting part for a lot of us was the choice of the name Combined Arms. And I know you all had discussed uh, both with Brad on the official Warlord podcast and a, a number of other people had talked about it. You even talked about it on the official Warlord you know, video interview that the intent was to be able to show the disparate elements of military power, naval, land, air, uh, all how it worked together. And, and I think that's one of the interesting parts that people are going to either love or hate walking into this game because we all come in with this prefabricated notion of what combined arms means to us. And we tend to assume it also means the same to you. <laughs> and so one of the, the parts as we've walked through this is I've had to explain to a lot of people that this is, in fact, that boxed war game. This is, this is not an attempt to do everything at all times and to simulate every possible campaign branch and, and interaction uh, because that rule book would be longer than bolt action. Uh, but, it, but it's an attempt to provide you a, a digestible couple hour game and also a, a branching system. And we've had the argument on the, on the Lead Pursuit podcast of is it a campaign system? Is it an operational you know, game system? You know, all all the, the things you do when you're podcasters and have nothing else to do than argue. Uh, but, but we've talked about those things because it's people, or at least some of the feedback that we've received, people walk up and see the game and they go, oh, that's a totally different scale than I assumed. And I laugh and I go, didn't you look at Warlord's own video? Didn't you go to their website? But, but you know, once again, we have this, this, this you know, mental image. So talking about that, how did, how did the fact that you had to bring naval air, land power, and a concealed movement system kind of all together into one game, how did that uh, drive you either to compromise or to lose your mind? <laughs> well, I think Jack will take the, the scale one because that's funny. I mean, uh, the, the scale one is definitely, there's a lot to talk about, but I just wanted to pick up on the second, on uh, a thing you said about the name Combined Arms. Something that we haven't said in other podcasts or in other interviews, I think, if I, unless I remember wrong, is the, the name, the naming process. Is always a very interesting part of, uh, of any any game, any anything, any product you make. So actually, this wasn't like the first name we had for this. We we, we went through endless different iterations of oh, this is what it's called, and uh, it was called something like Total War at some point. We, we had you know we had all sorts of different. Do you remember any of those? I think or, um, what was the? I think Theater of War was Theater one of them. Of War, yeah, um, right. yeah, there was. Definitely uh, a big brainstorming. Risk two. Risk two. And I know how that goes with, with with our own work over at Mariner Games and, and just trying to go through and, and brainstorm the name of a game that's pretty straightforward, but you can't call it Spaceship Combat, but it's not Starfleet Battles. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Names like that don't sell, so yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Combined Arms was uh, from Warlord, actually. I think that was from Darren. And um, yeah, they were very... Uh, which I think, yeah, it gets across the um, the idea of it's these three systems that are combined in the uh, in the game. Yeah, um, so that it is throughout. the best from the point of view of it's air, land, and sea, isn't it? Mm. Specifically, it's three games or four so, game systems that each one covers one of those. So I think it's yeah, it's a good name. That probably that's why we called it that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Brilliant idea. But to dive into the uh, the scale thing, that is sort of an interesting uh, an interesting point in that. Uh, the sort of original design I did of of the game um, was at a a much smaller scale. The uh, the idea being that um, it would be the maps were sort of an area, but not a recognisable area. Um, so this one might be somewhere in northwestern Europe. This one might be in Africa, but it's not specifically you know Berlin or um, anywhere specific. So that sort of allowed us to create sort of these maps that were designed for the for the game essentially because i mean there are some sort of key elements every every side needs basically enough water for the uh, the naval part of the game to be important um but not sort of um, and then enough land and uh, for the objectives and th and this that and the other and there's sort of a few things to balance that um that sort of we went through to sort of create those those maps um, and Warlord were very, uh, very specific on sort of when we, when we sort of got a bit way through development that no, they had to be sort of actual, actual places and they had to be these uh, sort of historic sort of theatres, uh, which expanded the scale of the game hugely suddenly rather than sort of uh, platoons and um, uh, sort of, you know, the cruel seas. 
which is sort of about flotillas and, and small sort of um, coastal coastal warfare sort of ships. Um, it became sort of a much bigger beast um, that still sort of um, I think flows, uh, but does give a different uh, a different style and a different uh, sort of story to the game. Yeah, and it's it less just... less Band of Brothers, more sort of D-Day and um, Saving Private Ryan. <laughs> yes, yes like the longest so... day. Yeah, no, it is definitely interesting because it went the pendulum went both ways. We started, you know, much more local and generic. Uh, and when we had the first iteration of the maps from, from the, after the Warlord the feedback, they were actually huge, huge, you know. It, so to a point that we went, guys, these are too big, uh, really too big, because, you know, this is bolt action, it's a platoon level game. You cannot have Stalingrad, <laughs> <Yeah>. huge <laughs> city, huge <laughs> ways of this. It feels, because basically the feel there was like you were playing Axe and Allies. You, you felt like this is, these are armies, these are not you know, the small mm. units. Uh, these are giant things. And then you go, right, re resolve this on the map, on, on the table with my 30 guys and one exactly. tag. <laughs> You're going to go, no, that doesn't. So we had to compromise. And there is still a degree of abstraction, of course. You know, you, you can certainly imagine that your the scale of the of the units is not literally one to one. So you will have to make some degrees of, a, of an adjustment and, and abstraction. Some maps, I think, are more... Uh, better, as in the process smaller. I think the Guadalcanal is my favorite, I think, because it's, you know, mm. it, it has this, it's a perfect game thing. Isn't it? It's like, there's an island with a sea all around, and it's nice and balanced. So I think for me, that's the one that works best. But uh, it was interesting. It was interesting trying to accommodate both the has to be historical, has to be real with the our abstract in start. So it was, a, it was an interesting diplomatic process there <laughs> yeah and i've played through on both the guadalcanal and the north africa maps and so those have been very different games and and enjoyable in different ways and also frustrating in different ways when you you realize that the the mindset you took from a previous terrain layout may or may not work depending on objective placement and all those kind of things but i think the the interesting perspective from you all is how and I'll put it in air quotes, historical, Warlord wants to try to drive things, and that absolutely did change our mindset when we would play the game as we would look at it. And traditionally in, in campaign-style games, we've used kind of a three-to-one ratio where we've said, okay, in my mind, at least if I have a platoon or a company here, I can blow that up by three or four times, and that's the unit I'm pushing around the campaign board. But there's, there's also times that we laughed with some of the air battles that we, uh, we ended up looking at, and I'm like... I'm going to resolve this with six airplanes on the Blood Red Skies table. <laughs> and you realize that the, that the goal is to make something playable. There's, there's always that compromise of, sure, I could go out there with 24 airplanes per side and actually resolve what this air battle might have looked like, or I can play it in Blood Red Skies with six or eight airplanes and, and actually get done in you know an hour, hour and 15, and get back into the game. Because I think that's what so many people lose the focus on, that this was not intended to be Empire in Arms that's going to take you all the way a year to play through a game. This is something where you can play a turn, a part of a turn, go resolve it elsewhere, come back in, continue playing the turn. And obviously, when, when as you guys have alluded to, you have the 3,000-point bolt-action army versus a 200-point bolt-action army, uh, don't bother <laughs> setting that up on the table. Just roll the dice and let that one go. <laughs> yes. I think that was uh, Andy Chambers' uh, first impact when, when we invited Obzi because because you know I know bolt action mostly but frankly we have we, we played the other systems but definitely not to the same extent we needed experts to to, to advise on uh, on Blood Red Skies and, and and so we invited Andy Chambers over to, to give us advice and it was really funny when he went oh, sorry how many planes are this it was like no 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 <laughs> <laughs> so he gave us definitely the scale of the of the game and the, how playable how how easy to resolve would be within a set between a decent amount of time what would make a good game of blood rest guys which is obviously we didn't have that level of sensitivity for that game so so it was uh, it was very useful for us well and that's an interesting thing that we've talked about as you know various people have their own desired use of what they want to do with combined arms and a number of people have come to us and said, oh, I could do it for my you know, club games day. And I say, just realize Blood Red Skies games and Cruel Seas, you know, resolve a lot faster than bolt action games on the average. And so be, be careful what you set yourself up for or tell your Blood Red Skies players to go get a sandwich after they play. Uh, you know, because there, there is, they are very different systems. And they're, thankfully, they are. I, I enjoy them all for different reasons. But I also love the fact that Blood Red Skies 
super generalizes things and plays very fast with a limited model count. So um, those are, are some of the, the conditions or considerations we've, we've asked people to, to walk through when they say, is this the right game to do a campaign with? Um, and, and kind of along those lines, was, was there anything you all stumbled into that you didn't necessarily intend to design it that way, but as soon as you played it, you're like, whatever we're going to do, we're not going to fix that mechanic. It actually works out right, we guessed, <laughs> and, we, and we surprised ourselves. <laughs> Good question. One thing that was sort of in there as a um, as kind of a placeholder and then needed very little tweaking um, was the escalation mechanic. Yeah. Um, so um, it was kind of this idea of basically whenever one player gets a gets a victory point, the other player can add a add a unit from their reserves in it, sorry add a unit into their reserves. Uh, so that they can sort of place that onto the board. The idea being that a bit, like the player that's winning gets a handicap and the player that's losing gets a um, gets a bonus, which is a very un sort of historical wargaming way to <laughs> <laughs> um, to approach it. But um, but the the idea, especially at that sort of smaller scale that it was originally, is I mean you're if you're winning, the commander's not going to send you more units you seem to be winning and he needs those units to go off to a different front and to you know solve problems elsewhere whereas if you're losing well maybe he is going to send send you reinforcements and uh and keep you sort of buoyed up um so Actually, it's very interesting what you say because you're right what you said that it works better at a smaller scale. Actually, never, I never reflected upon that, but actually this is very true because on a operational giant campaign scale, that makes less less sense. You know, if we're losing the war, suddenly I'm not getting more resources, right? <laughs> it's like, it feels like, oh my God. But on a, on a smaller scale, then you're right, because locally I may be losing this battle on a big campaign or a big operation. And yes, that's where the commander can go, oh, okay, we send some reinforcements that way. Yeah, and that works fine. So that actually is good. How do you think but, of that? Um, yeah, and that's that's a mechanic that was sort of day one, just plop that in and sort of you know sort this out later. Um, <laughs> but but did sort of um, stay there and, and even the numbers didn't didn't really change. It was you know one victory point, one um, one unit, and uh, ten victory points to win. Um, sort of, I, yeah, I enjoyed right. that. It worked out well for me the other day as I was getting pushed off the table. So <laughs> while the allies grabbed three victory points, I was able to start putting more units back in. But you, you but bring up have, an interesting... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, there, there have been uh, games in playtesting where sort of one player takes a bit of an early lead and sort of kind of leaves themselves open and tenuously grabbing these sort of these objectives. And the other player has sort of three or four more more units that they can use to really sort of push forward and hold those sort of objectives more securely than the other player did and sort of has been able to sort of come back and, and secure a victory, um, which is definitely like, it's definitely a catch up mechanic, but it is something that you can game as a player. You can go, actually, I'm not going <laughs> to capture that objective just now. I'm going to sort of pounce on it um, at the opportune time when I know I can hold it against what he's going to throw at me. Well, that was one of the interesting points is seeing how the different objectives all interact. And obviously with two functions for each objective type, you know, and, and being able to flip over the card uh, the next time you play the game and have something different uh, or a ran different random draw, it, it made some of them a, a much more useful uh, mm. piece to fight over. And some of them were like, oh, I'm glad I put that out on Crete because I don't care about the radar station. I'm not going to bother seizing that objective. But the, I think, Alessio, you really hit to one of the, discussions we'd had amongst the podcast and some other guys is that we couldn't pin down the scale. We, we couldn't call it an operational game. It certainly wasn't strategic because you weren't doing, like you said, these, these vast armies and, and vast operations. And it's somewhere above tactical. So we were all calling it a super tactical game because there, <laughs> there are times that you didn't feel like you're making a tactical decision. You were literally making a logistics decision. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to hope that, that one of the next cards is going to get something out of my dead unit pile to bring back on um, and, and not overextend myself. But it's, I, I think that for, for me was a lot of fun. I know it was a hurdle for one of our gamers where he just, he is, was such a standard grognard, uh, you know, that he, he had to know what scale everything was. And I said, hey, 
this is a warlord game. This is generalized. Let's have fun first, <laughs> drink beer second, and then let's figure out you know the, the actual games we're playing later. <laughs> It's very true. I mean, the, the there, as I said before, there is there has to be a certain suspension of disbelief. There has to be yes. a right. So yeah, okay. These are you know my platoon here is fighting for Stalingrad. In some cases, you huge big target. You're gonna go well. Let's not think too hard. I think is again is not a simulation. Much like Bolt Action, to be honest. I mean, Bolt Action is follows the same philosophy. You know, there is much is more towards play. And, and fun than uh, simulation actors. So, so he's not quite squad leader, I'm afraid, sorry. <laughs> well, and, and that's why I laughed a little bit listening to you talk to Brad was the, the fact that you felt going forward with Warlord and Osprey, you know, in your discussions on, on other projects, it had always been, they were super historical. And I laugh coming from the world of where Avalon Hill is my, you know, historical benchmark. I'm like, no, Warlord's fun. Warlord's are, games are games about the movie that was about the book that was written off of someone else's account of something that might have been historical or might have been totally made up either way. <laughs> so there's, there's a level of, of removal from needing to be historically perfectly accurate. We don't worry about uh, army order of battle. We don't worry about all those things. We worry about the, the gaming and the decision making. And, and to be quite honest, the interaction with the other player across the table. And that's, that's really where I enjoyed Combined Arms is that we found ourselves either exploring what we felt were useful tactical decisions or doing something and then realizing that was really dumb and now I'm going to spend two turns catching up. So, it <laughs> and I think that um, that point about sort of the the movie is is what you're playing sort of often um, as much as um, the sort of historical armchair general uh, vibe is is a is a good a good comparison because you are that's how I sort of imagined it at that scale is you're not saying that there's you know three platoons taking Stalingrad um, you're saying that the battle for Stalingrad that you're fighting, you're following these three platoons and sort of their victory is a metaphor for your larger victory at the sort of the grander scale. Um, because obviously not many players have the, the points to put down sort of an entire Stalingrad battle or the willpower to play that for 10 hours. <laughs> I, think exactly. the, I think the word is snapshot. I think that's yeah. what we say. You're yeah. looking at the snapshot of this particular action within that theater i mean the the good conversation about this was when world was going no no everything has to be absolutely named all the music and we went okay what was the name of the village they were fighting in in uh, in saving private ryan like oh uh uh I said, see, it doesn't matter. <laughs> the name was matter. Nobody Cares. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It, it's enjoyable. Well, you know what's happening. You know it's France. You know, you know who's there and why. Uh, exactly. The actual, what, what village was that? It was like, all right. Uh, you know, is, is that, that element of it? It doesn't matter. Right. Well, that, and that's one of the, the things that I've taken to, I, I guess, when I play this game, briefing people on when we actually transition to the, either the bolt action or to the uh, Blood Red Skies table that, as you said, we're either playing a snapshot of, of that battle or we're playing the culminating point. So maybe this platoon assault on this fortification is what tipped the entire battle. So win or lose, that determines who, who seizes uh, that chunk of terrain. So that for, for gamers, then they can kind of emotionally invest in it and realize this is, this is the one thing that's going to at least determining the win or lose piece, maybe not the unit destruction, but the win or lose piece, uh, and then obviously go through the campaign rules for unit destruction uh, and things like that, which still make my head hurt because now you're making me do math uh, when I do bolt action. And <laughs> I'm, already, <laughs> I'm already terrible enough at math. Uh, but let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, just the, in the basic game, some of the things that I know over at Modeling for Advantage uh, they've talked about house ruling or things that we've seen a couple times that seem super powerful. Uh, and I really wanted to ask you all the designers, that, you know, did you run across these things? Did you say, no, everybody, no one ever did that. That's stupid. Why would you make that mistake? Um, but air power is one of the biggest ones. And so air power is obviously extremely powerful in the game. Mm -hmm. It resolves in its own phase. It does things beforehand. Yes, it can be shot down, but it, it quite honestly is one of the most survival. It is the most survivable unit in the game. Uh, the modeling for advantage crowd was like, we're going to limit it to one airplane uh, per side. And I think that's no fun. I think you, you give away your opponent a chance to either overemphasize air power uh, or to, uh, to you just have some impressive air battles. But how did you guys feel when you wrote air power into the game? Was there a, a conscious decision of, we want this to be super powerful or we want it to be super survivable? What were some of the thought processes? 
So air power is definitely a sort of a hard counter to uh, to navies and sort of that that naval like advantage. Unless you can sort of match the opponent's air power, then you, especially your units and transports um, are absolutely at the at the behest of uh, of the enemy. Um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting sort of um, thing. We definitely wanted it sort of. It is more powerful in terms of sort of being able to, um, obviously, its speed and, and sort of being able to just choose a point and destroy it. And, and that sort of um, that power is is very powerful, uh, but it can't hold a point and it cannot win a game like on its own. Um, you need to sort of back it up and you need to have the units there to take the thing that you want to actually uh, to actually hold, because at the end of the day, you need sort of uh, units next to the um, next to the objectives to win. So I'd say that definitely, yeah, you're not going to win without air power. Um, in a way, I think the only one that you could win sort of without investing in uh, is naval power on, on certain maps. You could sort of uh, play a game with sort of just the land units, especially if you're sort of doing North Africa or something where you can just sort of trundle along um, across the, uh, the coast. Um, but then sort of naval power gives you that... Um, like that that speed that uh land power just just doesn't have um yeah so air power is definitely strong uh, it's definitely sort of combat wise i'd say it's the the strongest sort of uh, force in the game um but you can't win with just air power so right. you've got to beat right. them somehow <laughs> yeah, i never yeah, seem to be able to make my them. enemies air power go away <laughs> and never shoot enough of them down <laughs> okay so let's let's pivot from talking about the the base game itself to the campaign uh, play, the, the integration of, of the bolt action, Blood Red Skies, Victory at Sea, Cruel Seas kind of games. You, from listening to your previous discussions, you all intentionally chose not to make a vast matrix of the influences of the board game on your bolt action or other Warlord game. I know some gamers are not that way, and Alessio is probably laughing to himself knowing this many times about bolt action players or otherwise. They, they love it to be super scripted and handed to them that when, when you do X, this is the kind of game you play. Uh, how did you guys compromise on that in your thoughts between giving some structure so that your bolt action and other game players would put something fun on the table but not make it so restrictive that you were following a if-then, then-this matrix? It's a delicate balance, isn't it? Because I guess it's a matter of personal taste, like you were saying. You know, some, some people would prefer a far more you know, strict set of guidelines. I, I tend to find that the more rules you write, the worse the product, <laughs> the final product ends up being. Because uh, the more you write, trying to you know cover all angles, the more you're actually opening cans of worms. You're yes. kind of going, oh, yeah, because you wrote these other bits about this bit, this bit, this bit. Oh, what about these other bits? And what about this bit in conjunction with this other bit here? Uh, so we tended to go for the approach, with a, minim a minimalist approach, I guess, which is I tend to stick to as much as I can, where where uh, simplicity should make the thing smoother and more enjoyable, where actually the, the, the idea, the, the, the holy grail you're trying for is you're creating a game where you're thinking about the next move, not about the 17 rules that you have to remember to get from A to B kind of thing, where you're like, no, no, there's only one or two, three things you have to remember, but what's What's your next? What, 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 what is your next move? What, what or what? Or even better, what is the opponent's next move? You know, what is he going to do? So what should I do to counter what he's going to do? You know, like when you're playing chess, the, the, you're not thinking, "Who? How does the bishop move again?" I don't remember. Well, have I checked the special rules for the for that knight? You don't there, right? You're thinking, right? So he's going to do that, and then I'm going to do this, and then he's going to do that. Uh, for me, that's the more enjoyable part rather than digging for the rule book going for oh what's the page what's the rule so um, and having arguments about it so I think for me the more you keep it simple and remove stuff the more the game becomes a good game but I, I, I fully understand and know for experience like you were saying that not everybody agrees <laughs> yeah it, it is just funny because we've had a couple of people ask the questions of so how does having a uh, uh, a fortress on the on the board change things, or how do how do these various objectives change the bolt action game that I'm playing? And I say they don't. That's up to you as the gamer to decide. Uh, and I think that there's 
there's some freedom there. I, I understand why in games that have a very competitive background, people people want more explicit and less, uh, you know, open to to gaming or to narrative discussion. But to me, it's the beauty of the system is, at least on the board game piece, I am not concerned about sculpting everything such that I will win the Blood Red Skies game. I will solve that when I get to the Blood Red Skies game uh, and not worry about that in my moves. It will literally be me and my opponent reacting to each other, and if that results in something that goes to another table for bolt action, Blood Red Skies, or a victory at, at sea, then we'll solve that over there. And, and that's been an interesting um, uh, you know, line drawn between the game systems that the initiative cards are really the only thing that, that travel across. And so not even the weather effects from like the resolution deck, not the uh, the national effects. Those things don't transition into that game on another table, which I, th- I think is good. Uh, I, I think the problem is some people are afraid that if you don't tell them exactly how to play that bolt action game, that they're going to get it wrong. And I'm like, this is your game. You and your, you and your buddy discuss how you want to play it. And if you want to play it across a fortress, play it across a fortress. You want to play inside a factory, play inside a factory. You know, do, do what yeah, you Not want. everybody, like you said, not, not everybody has the right terrain for the right season weather effect uh, buildings a exactly. type of area so like you're saying some people that have all of that gear can follow that but i cannot force you like you must play this on a cityscape you know this has to be played on a, on a city- i don't have a cityscape what do i do right. <laughs> it's like right. so the approach is if you can if you do have it then go for it but otherwise you don't have you don't feel like you you fail because you don't have the right terrain kind right. of thing. And, and I think that's a wise approach because, once again, especially in a system that is very competitive like bolt action, people uh, sometimes have a hard time just stepping back and saying, we're going to build the best fun game we can, and maybe the odds are already stacked against me. It's 1,000 points versus you know 500 points with those armies, but we're still going to play it. So I, I think that was a, a, a wise choice to, to step away from. I know it, it frustrated me the first time I read through the rule book, but then I stepped back and said, Okay, I need to I need to think about what the average person has in their game store, in their house, or their even their armies. You know, can they field some of these armies? Um, so moving on from there, uh, obviously we're Blood Red Skies podcast, and obviously you guys are not Blood Red Skies experts, and that's fine. Uh, but you know, you had talked to Brad, and we talked uh, at the beginning and a couple times uh, about you know Andy helping you guys to understand some of the nuances of Blood Red Skies and how to you know work those back into the campaign feel because. Every one of the games uh, interacts a little bit differently. They generalize some things. They are very specific about others. Uh, was there anything that you, you guys walked in and after Andy explained it to you, you realized we totally got Blood Red Skies wrong when we, uh, when we drew up how we thought we'd interact? And, um, so, Skate was one thing, wasn't it? There was, yeah, it was, um, there was the fact that uh, I think, oh, what was it? Um, there was a sort of, there used to be a base. Um, so the way that air power worked originally is basically at the end of each each round, you would have a, um, a chance to sort of have a have an air battle. Uh, and it was sort of, it was off the board. You didn't place uh, air, air units on the board. Uh, they were just off the board. And basically, um, I, I would place orders to basically increase my air power in the, in the region. And you would sort of, you might fight that with your points or um, with your order tokens, or you might not. And at the end of the uh, end of the phase, if basically neither of us had bothered to try and get a superiority, then nothing would change. Otherwise, we'd have a Blood Red Skies game, uh, the points of which sort of depending on how many air units we had in our reserves and how many order tokens we'd sort of uh, built up on um, CAP and stuff like that. And yeah, so basically like it was sort of this this formula that kind of didn't really bring out the right numbers quite a lot of the time. It was quite often sort of uh, one-sided in a way that wasn't particularly fun. And if you had a superiority, you would probably keep it for the entire game, um, which meant that you could... Uh, I mean, if you're uh, worried about air power being too strong at the moment, it was definitely uh, <laughs> sort of if you had air power, you're like, okay, basically I get to just reveal a couple of things and destroy something every round. It's like, no, yeah. that's that's way too powerful. I think um, I remember Andy saying when we we presented him with the original version where he said, you know, like uh, this 
could generate very often very unbalanced games where the difference between the forces in one player and the other player would be very very swingy because it was generic abstract in the sense of all of your all, all of your air power is in this place it doesn't matter where it is it was, so there was it wasn't located on the on the map so there was often lots of playing against a very few players which he was like this is not an interesting game you really this makes not a good game because it is too unbalanced in terms of you know what you could have a bolt action game where you know if the scenario you're playing is right okay uh, i have to escape this little force is trapped but it has to you know if the scenario is a breakthrough then you can still play it right. uh, if right. the scenario or is the last stand where points are allocated in a certain way and you have some so you could probably make it work but he was just saying this does not work <laughs> You have to not have this level of imbalance. So again, yeah, that was a big. Yeah. Also, yeah, it didn't yeah. feel. Sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, I think that's the the interesting thing with just looking at the mission set, and it, it kind of leads into my next question: is you know realizing things in bolt action that are uh, that are done specifically for just initial balance of forces for point values, and Blood Red Skies has some different concepts about that. I mean, there's literally free aircraft in, in Blood Red Skies that sometimes can be quite deadly, even though they're classed as bombers or, or you know, free, uh, free attack aircraft. Uh, so, you know, we were, we were looking at a couple of the scenarios and we, we kind of laughed that we're like, well, you know what, I feel like I should always ask my opponent, uh, don't roll on the table, let's play something with bombers. So that way I get extra free firepower, you know, and, and work through it that way. But th that really brings up the, the question that some of our guys asked was, what drove you to, in the rule book, reference the Midway starter set specifically, knowing that it's kind of a, a subset of all things Blood Red Skies in, in its, its rules and its in, in interpretation? Was that a, is that kind of a warlord decision? Uh, or is that kind of y'all's decision to say, let's make it, you know, let's sculpt it to be entry level and not say you need all these expansions and other, other rules books that, that might add uh, more flavor? Yeah, that that um, that came in with uh, with the editing of okay. uh, from from Warlord, um, sort of giving the players I think a um, an idea, especially if um, this isn't picked up by someone who either doesn't play Blood Red Skies or maybe doesn't even play like any of it and has just sort of found this in a game store, and then sort of giving a bit of advice of oh here's actually how you could get into this and could play this. Um, here's sort of a box set that gives you stuff you need to play and actually uh, right. and somewhere to start um so that's definitely aimed at sort of the um the new player and getting them into the game i think for us being blood red skies aficionados and knowing that i'm the one player on the podcast without a bolt action army <laughs> that we've we've gone to making uh and I, I hate the term house rule but that's what i'll use making the air interactions making more of them on there so uh, we have opened it up to the full list of scenarios in airstrike, and we've also tried to target some of those that when you have, uh, you know, enemy uh, ground units adjacent, use something like priority target or use targets of opportunity, one of those, uh, you know, attack-centric kind of missions where you still have a lot of air-to-air -air play and you're doing what is supposed to be done in that air battle phase, but you feel like it's, it's something that's, you know, less, less genericized. Um, just because our guys get bored of playing dogfight all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that you, you say that in your group, uh, most people play Blood Red Skies and not so much bolt action because uh, it's, it's quite interesting to think that people are playing combined arms, but they are effectively Blood Red Sky exactly. players. So uh, it's actually, actually that we obviously probably naturally, because I play bolt action a lot uh, and I'm involved in the design with bolt action, if you want combined arms, is first of all bolt action, and the other two systems, if you want, are not the core of it, because I guess the the, the core of the whole warlord system is bolt action, of course. And, and and then you're talking about the crowd, which is basically different from the designer crowd that made it. So it, it probably the, the mindsets are different, the expectations are different, uh, the point of view is is different. So it's actually I cannot even put myself in the in the, in, the, in, the, in your mindset of, of your of your group, uh, which is, you know, you know so eye opening. It was like, well, okay, uh, have we tried this with a com community that is only playing well, one of the, the naval or the or the sky, but not the bolt action? Not action. Interesting. Yeah. And that's why we don't call it. We don't play it as if it were a campaign game. We kind of call it a mission generator. 
So we play the board game and we work our way through the board game and have fun playing the board game. And then it generates a mission, you know, in, in one of these requirements. And, and we don't necessarily want to play every one of them. There's been times that we look at it and we go, yeah, let's just let's just roll the dice on that one. And let's come back to a much more interesting Blood Red Skies mission later. But but that's why we class it as a as a mission generator for us, because we just we aren't. We're not using the same air units over and over again. We feel like we want to extrapolate that it's the entire air forces yeah. of that of that theater. Um, but it's but it's once again what what we're taking y'all's product and bending and bending it to our will. <laughs> As, I would have it no other way. I think. Uh, Anyone who takes a wargaming product and plays it as it says out the book is a philistine. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've done that like once, and I'm like, that, that just isn't fun to me. I'm going to do something different. I'm, I'm immediately going to house rule something, not because I have to, but because I want to. <laughs> it's interesting what you say about um, Mission Generator, because I think that's what games like Combined Arms are, are really for. It's, it's, it's a fun way of giving context to a game you enjoy playing. Um, my, my dad plays... Um, uh, IL-2 Sturmovik, the uh, flight simulator, uh, World War II. And um, he plays in this group that uh, basically was playing through the, the Battle of Britain. And sort of every Friday they would they would basically do the missions that were done that that week. So it's not, it's not literally Sturmovik, so I don't think there were many Sturmoviks in no, there. No, no, the, the, game is, <laughs> the, the game is called IL-2 It has expanded beyond uh, Sturmovik. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so he'd, he'd get in his cockpit and they'd, and so every, every Friday, most, most times there wasn't actually combat they'd, they'd just fly out, they'd do their patrol and, and come back and, and land and sort of, um, yeah, it definitely had this sort of role playing aspect to it. Um, but then they would get into these dogfights and there was a, basically a German team and a, um, and a British team. Um, and that sort of, cause I think you'd get very bored sort of in that game fairly quickly if you just jump onto servers and, and do dogfights every day and having this story of, oh, it's, you know, it's halfway through the war and, you know, this is what's happening in the papers and this is what's happening in the in the war, you know. We've just been kicked off of uh, mainland Europe and this is where we are in, um, in sort of the wider story. And having that sort of context helps in, in these games, just as having the sort of smaller context of like winning a morale test and having one one character holding a breach or having, you know, one sort of tank break down at an opportune moment that gives those tiny stories that give sort of meaning to the larger victory, having the larger story also give meaning sort of from the other end, I think really helps these um, these games that have come alive. You know, may I ask a question to you? Uh, so you said that your community mostly uh, plays, pretty much plays uh, Blue Skies, and uh, you are the only player there with, uh, with the Voltaction Army. Has anybody tried playing Voltaction Army? I was, I was say, so the, arms? Here's the scary part. It's actually the, the flipped part of it. So all the other podcasters have Bolt Action Armies, but we're geographically dispersed. We're not in the same area. And then the problem is in my uh, local gaming community, they all play Flames of War. <laughs> but but um but they a lot of them now play blood red skies for aerial wargaming so it's it's been really interesting and i think now what's going to end up happening is a number of people have said you know i think we might have to pick up a bolt action army except me because i'm i'm holding out <laughs> i'm not gonna do it <laughs> i'm not giving in i've avoided both bolt action uh i can't say victory at sea because i just picked up a pacific starter set but i avoided that in cruel seas um so, so I think it's an interesting dynamic for the people that physically play here and then the people we know that bought in um, to Combined Arms. Because I, I would say of the people I know that bought it, uh, either through Lead Pursuit or uh, just ordered it from Warlord, they, they fell into almost 50%. Half of them were Blood Red Skies aficionados that said, I want to buy something that plays larger, plays across game streams. And then the other half were like, I have, I have a foot in both game streams. I play Bolt Action and Blood Red Skies, and I want something that kind of combines the two. And I think that's, those, that second group is the people I'm more concerned about when they get the product. And I say, remember, it's Warlord. It's genericized. We're playing, you know, we're having fun. We're not simulating. <laughs> because there's, there is a, an element of, I think, with multi, um, multi-rule set gamers that we want a lot of specificity and I don't know why I've, I've, I've never figured out that psychological dynamic. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's been driving a lot of the questions that we get that are super detailed. And I look at guys and go, you must be a bolt action player. 
So. Yeah, I mean there are communities which are far far more uh, competitive. I guess is the is the word, and uh, yeah, definitely. In, I know that in the US the, there's a very strong competitive community for for bolt action, uh, like in Italy. I mean there are some countries that seem to take it more seriously <laughs> than others. Uh, well, maybe parts of Britain, or may, and maybe I'm generalizing. Maybe it's, it's not by country. Maybe it's by the people you know. But I have this feeling that uh, a lot of the people I play games here are more relaxed. Almost take war games as a role play game they have the approach this is a role play game it doesn't matter who wins we have, we have the, the evening is for meeting looking at the uniforms looking at the terrain have a pint have a beer play some games oh he won he lost it doesn't matter, oh, it doesn't I, matter yeah i definitely don't think that's uh, a by country thing i actually I, think part of that's by by age thing i think that age, you're yeah. sort of your youngsters are uh, calling me old <laughs> that you've told me many times how competitive you were back in yes, I back was. in the day with I the was, I was. army and yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. it's and true I, I think that yeah you get um sort of quite often quite often younger obviously uh, not not um not across the board uh players tend to sort of be more uh more about the game and the sort of the winning and the this that and the other and then quite often your older crowd is more into the history and the story and the um Everyone wearing the right uh, the right uniforms. I was going to say costumes. <laughs> yeah, right uh, costumes. <laughs> yeah. They've got their right costumes on. And... See, that is spoken like a true young person because that has scared <laughs> off so many of uh, so many of the gamers here. I, I got quite angry at a bunch of the guys in our historical group because we had a pop culture and you know comic kind of convention and some great gaming going on. A lot of board gaming, a lot of RPG gaming. I was the only historical gamer there. And I lost my mind on the guys because they're like, why would we go to a pop culture convention? I'm like, do you realize these board games they were playing all had military themes to them? But you historical guys didn't show up because it was pop culture. So it's it's interesting to see the dynamics and and the barriers we throw in front of ourselves uh, rather than just getting around a table and having fun, which I think uh, is the beauty of combined arms. I I I fully acknowledge that people are going to have a stumbling block with that because they're going to want. Uh, Axis and Allies Part 7 you know? definitely, is definitely definitely. this is a good point to bring up in, in this podcast because we haven't touched upon it but it's definitely not designed as a competitive system uh, it, it, so which is something that you know we, we could have to maybe make a mod a module or something of how to play combined arms in a tournament or something like that that's definitely not part of the design I, group I, I, don't, I don't think you want to and we talked about it uh, the last game I played last Friday that uh, in- inherently, you can't with the way the campaign rules are written because there's always a caveat of if both your players agree, do something different and guarantee in a competitive setting, people won't agree. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think you want to, at least in my perception, because we've talked about the the problem of linked competitive games and, and it's much like a complex rule system. You have to think through if A, then B, and what happens if all the ally players win and all the Axis players lose? Is the entire tournament over? Uh, how do those things work out? And you jumped ahead of the question I was going to ask next was, you know, is there a way to do it competitively? I don't know that there is. And, and I, um, if you all want to waste the brain power on it, <laughs> please feel no, free. I, I'll be honest. I wouldn't. Um, I think that it is, it is more a, a story. Um, it's, it remind well, it doesn't remind me of, um, but I was playing, uh, we played a couple of weeks ago or no, last weekend. Um, uh, Conquistador, um, <laughs> which is uh, an old IPS game, war game from the um, 70s, where you are conquistadors uh, heading to the new world, and uh, it's all it's all pretty uh, horrid stuff. But <laughs> um, it's a game you couldn't it, publish these days. I, I totally definitely understand. not in that level yeah. of detail. No. Yeah, yeah, without any sort of uh, any sort of care to what you're doing might be morally exactly. dubious. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes. But it had some rules in there that were just like um, you rolled on a random event table at the start of each round and you might be getting no colonists or you might be getting 20 colonists. And if you're trying to get around the Cape of South Africa, um, South America even, um, then, you know, you have to roll a die. And if you roll a one or a two, then you got passed, but a three up and you didn't. And that would screw up your game turn for three turns. It was one of these games where it was not concerned with who won that 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 could be determined by a die right you could be as tactical as you liked and someone might just roll sixes and win that game what it was concerned with was recreating that very vibrant very colorful story um and 
and doing so sort of with with its its crazy randomness which just yeah would not be um would not be acceptable i don't think uh, in a lot of circles nowadays uh, it's not a competitive game and you have to take it at that um yeah. i think combined arms is is not to that level uh, i think in general you sort of you know when you have the advantage you know when you're winning and you know when the other player is losing and you have options that allow you to push towards that and generally you know what you can do to do better and and what you know how you lost often right. Uh, you don't just go, oh, uh, I rolled a six on this event table and therefore I had no chance yeah. from one hour in. <laughs> but never, never for one minute we ever thought about competitive play of this Thank game. You. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting because actually it almost comes to be like, it's not like we said, oh, should this be for competitive play? It actually never entered the conversation. It was always like, yeah, it's, it's a campaign, right? So people will make it theirs. I've, seen, I've never seen anybody playing the same campaign twice in the same way there's always like oh all right this doesn't work let's change it uh, so i think the most common phrase is if both players agree yes. uh, <laughs> which is definitely that vibe of um it's from your um sort of napoleonic games yeah of, uh, it's interesting deciding what's fun i guess um, it's the difference between black powder and those systems of warlord and bolt action bolt action definitely the brief when i wrote bolt action was definitely this needs to be a competitive player a competitive game it needs to be. It needs to have organized play. It needs to have tournaments and stuff. So definitely, in fact, that's the reason why they asked me to write it as opposed to Rick, <laughs> because because Rick, brought, you know, Rick is so friendly in his, in his attitude to wargaming. If you read Black Powder, it's a fantastic read, but it is indeed for gentlemen to play with a cigar and stuff. It is not at all competitive. In, indeed, it cannot physically be played competitively. Competitively, and. We went absolutely for that with this. We never for a second thought, oh, all right, how do you, how do you organize a tournament of this? That wasn't the intent. It was definitely not, never there. It, it, think, um, closer to a role-play game campaign where you want to run something and you almost you could have a GM, a guy that makes it fun for everybody so that you know, keeps things nice and balanced. And uh, so it is more in that ilk, certainly, than a hard-nosed, you know, kill each other type thing. Good, because you know we've seen in a number of the events we've hosted, either at Adepticon or at a variety of other conventions, that competitive sometimes brings out the worst side in the community, and more importantly, it gets away from the having the having fun piece every once in a while. And so we've talked about specifically with Blood Red Skies and some of the other game systems playing, you know, linked narrative games where you feel like there's a that that all of them are going to influence each other, but there isn't you're not going to walk out with one person being the top player or one person being the second place player and that you're all playing against each other. That is, it's very much a, a working through collaboratively uh, on both sides. I think there's a, um, there's a wonderful quote. I think it's by um, Richard Garfield, um, designer of magic and Netrunner, um, of uh, the, the best competitive games have enough randomness in them so that the winner thinks they lot they won by strategy and the loser thinks they won but uh, they lost by luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, but uh, I think that that's true. I think um, uh, I think that yeah, sort of bolt action sort of delivers a bit on that and the um, yeah, you want sort of enough crunch there that you made you can tell whether you made the right or the wrong decision uh, and a bit of uh, randomness in there to throw some spice in there and. Um, let things flourish and go different ways. Yep. So you, you all have alluded to it a couple of times uh, that, that a follow on of something, whether you're going to do things, you know, new cards, new, new methods of playing, uh, what has been kind of kicked around in your brain that you can talk about, because I realize there's probably, <laughs> probably other projects from Warlord that we won't talk about that are related to this, because we all said, wow, that would work really well with Game X that isn't in this game. Uh, <laughs> but, but if you could talk about things that you've thought of, you said, you know what, maybe we need to see if the community's interested or if people generate a, a player mod for this, you know, what, what things have bubbled up that way? Well, maps is definitely the, the easiest answer, of course. Map, more new maps would be the, the easiest thing, but also, you know, colorful and interesting and uh, challenging, ch ch you know, change the, the challenge. So I think new maps is, is is probably the first place where we would yeah. go. I guess at the moment we're still waiting to see how the thing goes, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we... Yeah, we, we haven't really had these conversations of, um, oh, this is exactly sort of 
where the product line would go uh, with Warlord. Um, I think that uh, what would be quite fun is um, sort of working with uh, yourself for Boss Action and Andy Chambers for, for Blood Red Skies and sort of creating these like a little campaign book of like a bit more of that sort of oh if this then that um vibe to uh sort of uh expand on those on those campaign rules um perhaps with a set of cards that sort of further integrates that so that you sort of have this base game that allows you to use those games and then if you decide to oh you're super into your bolt action then you can buy this sort of secondary sort of expansion which sort of expands that that element um with the with the idea that you know you have bolt action and you are bringing that into the uh, into the game um would be i think a a cool thing to uh, to work on um and definitely bring that into the sort of more not competitive but more sort of um war game rather than the board game focused crowd like right. Uh, right. this is definitely um playing to uh, playing to both rather than sort of specifying <laughs> well, I, I know Andy uh, Chambers has in his portfolio <laughs> a uh, campaign system, a detailed uh, pilot, almost RPG-like mm. uh, system that he's been uh, working on and collaborating with various others, to include us, I guess, uh, on <laughs> on a system that that would add, you know, more campaign-ish, role-playing game-ish uh, interaction to even link uh, what's going on in the board game further on with what you're doing. Uh, but as we said, those are always slippery slopes of too many rules that you have to sometimes make sure you haven't, uh, you haven't introduced a loophole. Well, speaking of loopholes, if we have a little bit of time, and I know uh, everyone's uh, running short on time, but if, I'd like to pose a few questions uh, to you all from, from our gamers that have thrown a few things our way uh, in their games of combined arms. And we'll just throw out one or two of these if you all have time. Let's see well, what we can do. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> obviously, please do. Um, part of my job for Warlord is collecting FAQs and answering them. So if we don't have an answer now, we can sort of discuss them and, and publish the answer. And uh, the plan is to put the combined arms FAQs uh, in a separate page within the Bolt Action the PDF. There's a PDF of uh, a Rattan FAQs for Bolt Action. So it will have its own page for combined arms. So yeah, shoot. I, I'll make notes while we speak. <laughs> Uh, so the first one, which is funniest to us, because I think it was an intentional game design mechanic, but was talking about the resolution deck. Because when you read how it tells you to build your resolution deck, it throws putting in five of the situation cards with, uh, on top of five of the victory cards. And it never mentions shuffling the deck. And so we all said, well, did they intend us to do that so that we have to burn through these you know, situation-specific cards before we get to the victory points to give you a few turns to get into the game before you're evaluating victory points? Or, like, or was that an oversight? And then what happens at the start of the game when I have a victory card and I flip it and nobody used it, I, then I discard it? And so that was literally the first question was, is that an intentional mechanic or was that... Um, uh, so, yeah, so sort of mechanically, you want to have a situation card on top of the deck at the start of the game. Um, because, as you say, it's when do I flip and resolve that otherwise, because that happens sort of at the end of the turn. Um, so the idea was um, the uh, you have the victory cards sort of all layered at the bottom, then situation cards on top, which gives you those five turns basically to, to get yourself set up, to decide what you're going to push for, um, because at the start of the game, you're all in your sort of starting zones. Uh, you don't have any of the objectives, so... If, half of the objectives sort of go before you even had a chance to sort of get to them, then you wouldn't really have had a chance, like there wouldn't have been a point in, in pushing towards that objective and it could feel sort of cheap that, oh, I was pushing towards this and then it just appeared before I even had a chance to get to it. Um, so yeah, that, that was intentional. <laughs> Good. We, uh, we, we thought it was. it was. It was one of those things like, there's no way they forgot to write in there, shuffle the deck, you know? <laughs> and then um, uh, to be honest, probably could have had uh, sort of italics like, do not shuffle the deck. Right. On the further turn, <laughs> this will get shuffled. Because in, in the... Um, right, because on later on, once you once you burn through all of them, you'll you just shuffle, shuffle the deck. Yeah, and that... On those turns, your game state will be fairly randomized. You'll have, you know, in, in theory, at the end of those 10 turns, you'll probably have half of the objectives each. Um, or unless someone's doing better than the other. <laughs> um, this is a very good point that il illustrates part of the difficulty of creating those FAQs and errata as documents is deciding what makes it into the thing into into the rat like my brain now is going 
do I put this into the FAQs document? Yeah. <laughs> because I think, well, the answer is yes, i.e. follow the rules as written. So really there is no wrong rule here. It's, but like you were saying, it would have been more helpful to actually state, because, you know, naturally people tend to shuffle decks. Just don't, don't shuffle the deck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's wrong in the way it's written, but perhaps a... Help we all have, it, have habit patterns, especially playing things like leader series games where you always shuffle decks, you shuffle them between turns, you do things like that. And, you know. So the question is, for sure, this is not an errata, easy, as in there's nothing wrong to correct, but is it an FAQ? Well, I guess that, that depends if it's a frequently asked yeah, how many, question. How many times do you get asked? A lot of people say, <laughs> well, do you shuffle this? Then definitely, yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it in the maybe FAQ yeah, maybe. segment, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and we'll see. If it's frequently asked, then definitely we'll go into the FAQs, but definitely not on a rata. See, the, there is the decision of... Exactly. Should I go? <laughs> so, so the other one that, uh, that has been here is kind of a two-part uh, question. Uh, do you only and can you only place one type of each objective? Because there's obviously enough objectives that you could change the objective laydown and not place an airfield and place two supply depots or whatever the card came up to. And our, our counter to that has been, it, it explicitly states, when you grab the objective, take, pick up the card and put it in front of you so that you, you know what that bonus is. So what we've told people is we're like, over to you on, on what you want to do with the objectives in the game. But we think the intent was have one of each of those, five total, yeah. and roll through with that. So, yeah, it is one of each. Um, but when Warlord were making the sprue, essentially there was enough room to uh, to add more. For sort of <laughs> Which no those are risk. awesome sprues, and I'm jealous. I, I hate you uh, all for getting plastic in your game, and I still have <laughs> resin airplanes for for Blood Red Skies. <laughs> but, um, so essentially, um, I think that the enterprising uh, homebrew uh, player could certainly choose to um, to add sort of two two of one um, one type or and one less of another, or indeed. Um, sort of create even even larger maps with uh, with more objectives on them. Um, so yeah, essentially uh, that was sort of an extra little little gift. Um, <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> the, and the, cause, cause, I think this one qualifies because actually it is confusing mm. and because there are multiples, but the rule literally don't get the, officially you don't. So this is literally a thing that needs to be addressed. So this one makes it in the FAQs. <laughs> I had a real question that isn't, Doug, you're an idiot. <laughs> and, and second on that was, can I place an objective on a road? Because it, it's part of that whole thing is in the list of places I can place objectives, it does not say do not place on a road. And now I've had so much fun using that as both a spawn or a denial point by placing it on a road in my last couple games. And I'm like, I don't think they intended me to do that. <laughs> Uh, I believe you can uh, place it on a road. Um, I didn't see anything excluded. So. Just all the all the examples always showed it next to a road, around a road, and and when I yeah. was playing the Axis, uh, and and that was the objective I chose to place. I put it on the road, knowing that I was going to field a very armor heavy uh, force. So I kept respawning on the road and driving, you know, three hexes. Yeah. Uh, so um, toward, towards the enemy. <laughs> uh, I think um, yeah. On um, on page eleven, um, there's one place on Paris. Oh. Um, right. So uh, yeah, I think um, placing on a road is uh, yeah is a fine move, perfect. and uh, perfect. lets you sort of uh, yeah as you say. Um, I quite like putting oh, them yes. near roads. It's sitting right on top of Paris. I didn't even notice that. See, so you know, I should have looked looked at what was underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we will not add this to the. Yeah, I don't. I, no, I think it's I think it's perfectly clear. Look at page eleven, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, awesome. a, that's the way we this is always the worrying part it's like I've got some questions oh god is it broken yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know this is where I yeah. think yes my, exactly <laughs> you have to explain it because there's no video right oh we, yeah, exactly it, it will be the RTFM or RTFI or uh, let's see here what would we say the other for us that come from an aviation background uh, we have a manual called the NATOPS so it's RTFN read the effing NATOPS I can, and it's my own podcast I can say fucking NATOPS Tops. Uh, I, I already have an E rating, so what are they going to do to me now? Okay, last question, because um, this was this kind of is an outlay of that last uh, concept: uh, concealed movement. So concealed movement is addressed two different places in the book, and what made sense to us was that when you initiate concealed movement, you obviously have to be in the one or two orders uh, area to do that. You move like you are whatever unit just got concealed. So if you're armor, you move two moves. But then after that, we turned and looked at everybody and said, after that, you're just a concealed army unit. So you, by default, 
move one square or you blitz and move two. And it's when you're actually revealed that it allows people to understand, okay, that, that unit moved two, but it was an army unit, so it's not going to suffer the penalties of blitz and things like that. Is that, is that kind of what you guys were working for? for the Yeah, so, um, so infantry basically can move two. Right. Um, but they get the blitz token and can't participate in in battles whilst they have that blitz token. And I believe you can, as a move, sort of take the uh, the blitz token off. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, that that concealed move uh, can be used. Uh, obviously, your scouts can can move too, and you don't care whether they're uh, adding. To <laughs> Darn, my scouts not, blitzed again. <laughs> because they they just disappear and right. sort of can be used to uh, pretend. Oh yeah, I've got I've got armor. Um, uh, once the uh, the player the other player has sort of forgotten what where your pieces are and what they actually uh, what they represent, um, yeah. So you can um, you can move to basically with uh, with concealed units. Right. Yeah, I, I like the concealed movement piece in the last game that I played. It did not get used that much because we very quickly got into the North Africa grinder in half of the map, uh, you know, right in the middle. And so it was everybody just continually feeding more and more units into that in an attempt to, to grab the, the factory and the fortress. Um, but I can see how on, on a couple of different maps, especially with naval combat, uh, we used it a lot with Guadalcanal and it got very frustrating that you'd think you were hitting the enemy fleet and it was not. So <laughs> I, also, I also suspect maybe you guys have more planes to spot things around than, than, than the average. <laughs> we, we did. So, so <laughs> if, you, if you watch the playthrough uh, that we, we just put up there for the first turn, uh, the Axis, let me see if I get this right, I think the Axis has three and the Allies have two. So it, it's been an interesting, because we're trying to play an air power centric one and show how many battles you might have per turn, uh, that we just, we, we did go air heavy. Uh, and in Guadalcanal we did not, so at one point uh, we were sneaking fleets around the board and, and doing dastardly things. <laughs> well, thank you all for your time. I mean, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Jack. Uh, especially um, fleets with concealed movement, because there's obviously an infantry or a, uh, armor has only a few places they can go in any sort of particular time, whereas fleets, you can actually sort of do some surprising, terrible things. Yeah, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, thanks both of you all for your time. I really appreciate you taking the time out to talk about this and especially to answer the stupid FAQ questions. You know, we always have some random dumb questions, but I, I appreciate uh, the interaction from you all and getting to, to kind of peel back the layers about the game and how we ended up where we did, where we might be going next and, and what you guys think about it. Is there anything in closing you guys want to throw out there to either the communities or to the gamers picking up combined arms? Uh, only that we uh, we hope you enjoy and uh, yeah, and win all of your games, each yeah. and every one of you. <laughs> <I'd say that. laughs> well, also, I would say I'll break a like a spear, break a lance uh, in favor of uh, competitive play because, like Jack saying, I mean, I I used to be very competitive uh, in my in my youth. Uh, so uh, yeah, sorry guys if you think that this is not for uber competitive. It's not a definitely not a competitive system. But uh, if you want that, I keep playing uh, the bolt action tournaments because <laughs> I you know if you come to to England, I do take part. So you know, come and play here, and you you can you can. Slaughter me and have fun because you know, I'm not very good. But. <laughs> exactly. Well, well, thanks. I really appreciate it. And I know I've had fun with it. Uh, I have had to recalibrate what I expected out of it, but that happens with any game you pre-order before a playthrough or anything hits the mm -hmm. internet. Uh, when you get it in your hands, you have to then evaluate what is this game doing and what, is its, what are its strengths. So we've had fun. Um, I, I know there's still a lot that I am learning about how the initiative cards work and the dastardly things you can do there, uh, especially to your opponent when they're least expecting it. But uh, I, I'm enjoying it, looking forward to playing it at a couple of conventions for at least a, a quick step through of a game. Oh, did, you, did I did you lose me? No, no, sorry. Okay, sorry. You, you had that look, and I was like, if this is my internet crapping out, I won't. No, no. No, no. <laughs> I am in Alabama in the United States, so I think it's a tin can and a wire that connects my internet. <laughs> 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 it's not the finest. All right.